the algorithm we're going to look at, uh, which tries to prioritize shortest jobs, there are two of them. The first one we look at is shortest job for scheduling. Uh, this algorithm associated with each process the length of its next CPU burst. So in a sense, if you know what the, how long a job is going to running, uh, the shortest next C, uh, application is chosen. And so this has a big effect on short jobs because they get to run first. And if you have long jobs, then they're not really affected because the, all that they're going to be slowed down by is the short jobs themselves. So it doesn't add much uh, to the response time of a long job. For example, if you have a job that's one second and you have another job that's 25 seconds, right? So you have one second um, and then you have another one that's 25 seconds, then if you look at how long the 25 second one is going to be penalized by, so you have one and then you have 25, right? So the first one runs, if they run in this order, then the average, the second job finishes at time 26, right? The first job finishes at time one, not a big difference. The first job, if you had done it in the order 25 and then 21 uh, and one, then the first job would have taken 25 seconds to finish. So 25, uh, VSS 26, not much of a difference, right? And so that's the reasoning behind shortest job first. If you if you have shortest job queuing up first, then they don't really affect the long jobs. The problem is the length of job is not known at its arrival time um, in general, right? But it's possible to predict. Also, if you have short jobs arriving and there are a lot of short jobs arriving before the long job, then obviously long job is going to get penalized. For example, if you had 100 uh, one second jobs and one 25 second job, then uh, short ones are all going to run, penalize the long one, right? So that is obviously a bad thing. Uh, there are two versions of the short, shortest job. Uh, one is a non-preemptive one. Uh, once a job starts running, it just runs to completion. And then there's a preemptive one is at any given instant, if a new job arrives with remaining time, less than the remaining time of the current job, then you preempt the current job. And this is known as shortest remaining time first. And we'll look at the benefits of the preemptive versus non -preemptive. So the first example we're going to look at is shortest first job first, the non-preemptive version. So you have four uh, tasks. Uh, you have zero, uh, the arrival times are zero, two, four, and five. Not an important difference is now we're paying attention to the arrival time. Uh, typically with round robin or FCFS, we don't really pay attention to that. Um, it just assumes that they were all in the queue at the same time, right? And burst time of the, the length of the task itself is seven, four, one, and four. So if you look at shortest job first, so the first at time zero, when time starts, we only have P1 in the queue and we schedule it, it runs up to time seven. Remember, this is a non-preemptive version, so it runs to completion. At time seven, you can get to see both P2, P3, and P4, all of P2, P3, and P4. The reason is because they all arrive at two o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, all before seven o'clock. At time seven, hence, you can make an informed decision and you can choose the one with the shortest job, and that's P3, which is runs for time slice one, so you run P3. Uh, that runs up to time eight, and then uh, you P2 and P4 are the same, so it doesn't matter which order you pick them in, so you pick P2 and then P4, right? And you look at the average wait time, it's four in this case, right? So if you have a preemptive uh, scheduling policy, right? So then what's gonna happen is um, at time two, P2 has arrived, right? At time two, your P1, um, has run, would have, it's initially started with seven units and it ran for two slime time slices. So at time two, uh, its time slice would be five, right? Uh, and so compared to, so it went from seven, two to five, right? Seven minus two equals five. And so compared to P2, which has a time slice of four, and this one has a time slice of five, P2 is shorter, so you pick P2, okay? So then you run P2 for two time slice units, and then it would uh, you would notice that at time four, when P3 arrives, P3's um, burst time one is less than P2's burst time left, which is two. So then you schedule P3. And then P3 runs to completion. And then at that point, you again look, compare P1 and P2. And P2 has a shorter one, which is two, so you run P2 to completion. Uh, so P2 finishes at this point. 
um, P3 is already done. And then at time 7, P4 comes in. P4 has a shorter burst time than P1, so you schedule P1, sorry, P4, and then finally you schedule P1. When you look at the average wait time for this one, it's 3. So you compare to the previous one uh, versus the previous one, which was, I think, 4. Uh, this one's a lot shorter because you were able to do preemption. Um, so if you want to look at an example as to how shortest remaining time benefits, essentially think of three processes, okay? A and B are both CPU bound, each run for about a week. So you have A and B CPU bound one week, right? And C is I.O. bound. And you have a loop, one millisecond CPU, nine milliseconds disk. So C is going to want to use the uh, CPU every 10 milliseconds, okay? And if only one at a time runs, C uses 90% of the disk. And A or B use 100% of the CPU. With FCFS, once A or B get in, uh, they get to keep the CPU for close to two weeks. Okay, um, clearly not an ideal situation. Uh, if you look at round robin, essentially uh, your C keeps getting switched in every 10 milliseconds, uh, adds overhead, and so overall your disk utilization is pretty low because uh, if you have a round robin of 100 milliseconds, then what's going to happen is, which is already pretty short, uh, what's going to happen is that A or B are going to run I mean, on longer on, this, on the CPU. C is not going to run on the CPU, and if it can't run, it can't issue the I/O job. So, C is, um, needs to use the disk every 10 milliseconds, but it can only use the disk if it gets the CPU every 10 milliseconds for one millisecond. So, the C, C has to get the CPU for every one millisecond in order to be able to use the disk. If it doesn't do that, then it doesn't get to use the CPU disk. And so, what happens is. Because C does not get any time on the CPU, or it gets it uh, every 100 milliseconds when it wants it every 10 milliseconds, what's going to happen is your disk utilization is going to significantly fall down, and it's going to fall down to 4.5%. And if you use a much smaller time corner, then uh, you have a disk utilization improved significantly, but then you have lots of wake-ups, and obviously the scheduling cost is going to be very high. What happens with shortest remaining time first is C gets the CPU whenever it needs it, right? Because every time that um, when A or B is running, when C finishes up with the disk, it needs it for a millisecond. It's the shortest time amongst A and B because each one of them is going to run for a whole week. And so if you look at the CPU burst for C, it's going to be much shorter than the CPU burst for A or B, and hence it's going to get to run. And so what happens in this case is that overall disk utilization improves because C gets to use the CPU whenever it needs it. Hence, you know, trying to overall improve the disk utilization as well. And A or B get to run when C doesn't need it, improving their utilization as well. Shortest job first, one of the interesting things and um, is that both shortest job first and shortest remaining time first are provably optimal. That is, uh, they are as good as any of the other algorithms and shortest remaining time first is always at least as good as shortest job first and so this is an interesting property and if so if you compare shortest remaining time first with FCFS and round robin uh, what if all jobs are the same length if that happens then shortest remaining time first just defaults down to FCFS it has the same behavior as FCFS and if CPU bursts have varying length then shortest remaining uh, time first and round robin are similar. Short jobs do not get stuck behind long ones, which is what your goal is. And to further continue, um, the main challenge with the shortest uh, remaining time first, obviously there's the need to predict the future. Um, this may be possible in different ways. You keep track of what the system did earlier and then based on that make informed decisions. Um, but this, in general, is a hard task. There's also the notion of starvation, which I had uh, briefly alluded to earlier, where if you have a lot of small jobs, let's say 100 
of them that take one second, then let's say a hundred of them one second, and then one job a hundred seconds, right? And you schedule all the shot the one second jobs first, then the hundred second job essentially has to wait for a hundred seconds. Now its response time is halved, right? Or oh, sorry, it's, it's become twice. So essentially, long jobs may never get to run if you have too many short jobs. So you sign up to have a starving long job. Uh, in reality, though, it's really hard to know how long a job will take, which is the bigger problem. Uh, and normally, what happens is you use um, shortest remaining time versus yardstick in the sense that it's it's an algorithm to compare against. Let's say that you did know. Uh, what the length of a job was. Can you do, build, how well does the algorithm that you built compare to the optimal one, which is in this case is the shortest remaining time first. Uh, overall pros and cons, it is optimal, and cons is really that it's hard to predict the future.